We're back with On the Road of Recovery with Pete from Finley. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks so much for coming out and joining us. Can you start off by describing your childhood? Uh, as a child, I was uh, the only son and the youngest. Um, I had two older sisters. Uh, we grew up in a good family. Um, my parents both worked. Um, they gave us pretty much everything we wanted. Um, sometimes maybe too much mm. because that's how I ended up traveling down the road of alcohol and drugs. Okay. Um, but um, I mean, I grew up in a normal, normal child, um, played sports through high, all the way through high school. Um, just sort of got lost in between that those last few years of high school and then I started um, as a, a young adult started working regularly and just dabbled in a little bit of this a little bit of that mm -hmm. and um, it was a it was a now I know it was a learning experience um, I mean if I never would have went that way I wouldn't be sitting here now mm -hmm. can you share you know maybe a couple of stories that really paint the picture of what you what you were like when you um, were actively using? Um, steal from my parents, steal from my friends. Um, if you couldn't, if you didn't do anything for me, I wasn't doing anything for you. Mm -hmm. It was um, that type of relationship that uh, I was, oh, it was all about me. Mm -hmm. I was selfish. Mm -hmm. I was um, that guy that um, would, uh, be your friend and help you out anything you needed, you know, whether it be drugs, alcohol, money. Um, but you had to do something for me. Gotcha. And um, it was, uh, it wasn't, I didn't like that guy. I realize that now. Mm -hmm. At that time, it was like a more of a power trip. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and uh, I mean, I was um, the guy that walked in the bar with, um, because during my active addictions, I dealt a lot. Mm -hmm. So um, I was that guy that would walk in the bars with my entourage, mm -hmm. throw a couple hundred dollars down on the bar and say, let's, um, you know, let me know when that's done. Right. And then right. plus I'd have my entourage out, you know, slaying stuff for me. So it was, um, it was, a, uh, it was, um, not the guy I liked, but at this time, at that time, it was, um, I thought I was the king, you know. Yeah. But, yeah. But, so can you talk a little bit about how, um, were there any consequences during that time that you incurred? Um, DUI after DUI, you know, mm -hmm. I got in a car accident in 2008, um, ended up in a wheelchair for six months, not knowing if I was ever gonna walk again. Uh, wow. Nursing home for three months. You know, thank God right. that, um, you know, I didn't do prison time or I'm not dead. Right, absolutely. Can you talk, uh, share a little bit about how your relationships w with your family were at that at that point in time, towards the end of your active addiction? At that time, I really didn't see my family a lot mm -hmm. um, because I was out doing my thing. Mm -hmm. um, which one of the things that um, really made me really go wild in my drug and alcohol addictions was I had a sister that passed away at 48 oh my. from the use of prescription drugs. She ended up having a seizure, um, fell and hit her head. And I was living in Finley at the time. I was born and raised in North Baltimore, 15 mm -hmm. miles from here. Mm -hmm. They, um, when she did that, they took her to Wood County Hospital. I didn't answer the phone one Saturday morning. It was a Sunday morning, it was a Sunday morning. Didn't answer the phone, you know, I was sleeping. You know, I'd been up all night. And uh, then when I finally did answer the phone, they told me that my sister, it was my parents or my si other sister, told me that my sister was um, in the hospital. Um, didn't tell me that she was about dead. Um, by the time I took a shower, got around, wasted all this time, um, by the time I got to the hospital, she had already passed away. So, oh, I'm so um, sorry. Then I started coming probably right after her funeral. Um, I hit it heavy during her funeral. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't even, don't even think I went back for the second session of her funeral. Um, I, was, uh, I was a mess. And then after that, I really got um, more and more active and actually I think I went out of control at that time because all the dealing that I was doing ended up being more my self use oh then, okay and mm -hmm. so um, it was uh, and then like I said then come a year later um, was when I got in that car accident so let's talk about what happened that you decided you know you wanted to get help um, like I said by 
my first sobriety date would be July 11th of 2008. Mm -hmm. um, the courts made me go through um, a treatment program called moral reconditioning therapy, which is through Century Health here in Finland, mm -hmm. which is, I wish they never would have got rid of it because it changed my life. Um, I saw that everything that I had done in my life that was wrong was nobody's fault or that I got in trouble for was nobody's fault but my own. Mm -hmm. Um, I cannot blame nobody for nothing that I've done in my life besides myself. And uh, now they don't do that here at Century Health in Finley. Now, but also, the, all the hoops that the court systems had made me jump through um, the classes, the probation, um, you know, curfews, um, checking in weekly, mm -hmm. uh, drug tests. That stuff changed my life. It realized I realized that I could have a better life as long as I followed the rules, you know, mm -hmm. as long as I followed what I should be doing instead of what I want to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, and it changed my life. Um, that's, but then, like I said, I stayed sober for almost seven years. Mm -hmm. um, I got selfish and quit doing the things I needed to do. Mm -hmm. Quit my meetings quit my um, hanging out with my church friends, um, my accountability partners. Um, I started traveling again for work and I got selfish again. Um, doing a lot of things that I never thought I'd do again. Um, it got out of control. I ended up bringing stuff home when I come home on the weekends. And I realized at that point, if I didn't straighten out or get straight again and try to find help or because it was completely out of control. My addictions became way worse than it was the first time, quickly, you know? So um, I helped, uh, I checked myself into treatment because everything I had wanted in my life, a house, cars, a family, um, I was about ready to lose it all. Mm -hmm. So I ended up checking myself. And actually, while I was traveling, my pastor come up to my motel room and I was um, on the phone. He called me, he's like, hey Pete, let's go out to dinner. I had him on one line and my drug dealer from Toledo on another line. Which way do I go? Right. So I went with my pastor. I checked myself into treatment. I stayed in treatment for about five weeks mm -hmm. and I went through detox, went through one of their housing, which was Midwest Recovery out of Toledo. I've been sober now a little bit over three years. Spectacular. Can you talk about some of those things that you do, specifics that you do, you know, every day, every week to be able to maintain your sobriety now? Um, I just came from the jailhouse. I'm a mentor for um, a program here in Hancock County called Welcome to New Life. Mm -hmm. I'm showing guys how they just got out of jail or that are struggling a different way of life. Um, mm -hmm. But you can have a good life. You just need to change your ways. Mm -hmm. You need to start new habits. Mm -hmm. um, I do celebrate recovery twice a week. I do church. Um, I hang out with my church people. I hang out with, um, I get together with, 15 years ago, I never thought I'd be hanging out with pastors and, you know, and I do my recovery people. My recovery people are like my family. Mm -hmm. um, we call each other, we have cookouts, we, um, you know, go to concerts, we do all kinds of stuff together. Yeah. And, uh, it's not, it used to be all me, me, me. Now it's um, God, others, and then I'm with her, I'm third. I don't, um, I, it's not all about me anymore. Right. And, you know, if I try, if I see someone struggling, I'll reach out to them. You know, if I see somebody on the street struggling, I'll try to help them. Mm -hmm. um, I try, just, I mean, that's what, that's what my life is anymore. Trying to help others. And I find that when I do that, um, I don't stress out. I don't get angry. Um, I have peace. So. So can you talk a little bit about if you would have some type of a problem that would come up or some type of an issue, um, take us through what, what you would do, how you would handle a problem. I'd call my accountability people. I would call my um, people that know me. I mean, know me inside and out. They know, my, they know my struggles, they know my past. If my wife sees me even starting to like change a little bit, you know, my attitude or something, she'll ask me, how can I pray for you today? Or what's wrong with you? Well, we found out in a marriage thing that 
when you ask someone what's wrong with them and there's something wrong with them, they sort of like taking it personally. Yes. So they just taught us to say, how can I pray for you today? Okay. So uh -huh. um, it's a, I'm a, I mean, I, I got so many people that I can reach out to and that's what you have to do. You can't do anything by yourself. Nothing, nothing good happens out of trying to take care of something yourself. Right. That's why you have accountability people. That's why you have friends. That's why you have people love you. you know? yeah. Reach out to them. So you've talked about a lot of the gifts that you've been given in, in recovery and been able to really change your life. What are, what are, are there any dreams that you have for yourself today that, you know, wouldn't have been possible in active addiction? Pretty much my whole life is uh, something what I've always dreamed of, you know? Uh -huh. um, I have great credit. I have a house, I have cars, I have great friends. Um, a valid driver's license. Valid driver's license. I've even, I'm even able to hunt nowadays. I can even wow. carry a gun. Yeah. I got my CD, CCW. Yeah. It's I pretty mean, spectacular. I mean, life is good. Yeah. You know? It's, I mean, you've just talked about such a beautiful existence and the, it's given me goosebumps just to, to hear the, the change and the hope that you really have in your, in your daily living today. Um, is, are there any words of wisdom that really spoke true, true to you um, when you were struggling that you could maybe share with our audience? Don't do it yourself. Don't try it by yourself. You need people. Um, trying to do something on your own without others is uh, pretty much gonna fail. I mean, you need to reach out to other people, you need to be transparent and honest. And if um, you need help, come to a CR. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. You want my phone number? I'll give you my phone <laughs> number. Um, I'm always willing to help. But, um, Very cool. Yeah. Well, that's spectacular. And you really, I, I mean, I appreciate you being so honest. The uh, talking about, you know, getting sober, staying sober for, for a while and then stopping doing what was working and then, you know, having a recurrence of symptoms. Um, but you got back into it and you, you checked yourself into to treatment and it does work. Well, thank you so much for coming out and joining us. Was there anything else that we missed that you think would be important to, to share? Nope. Okay. Just keep coming back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much again for coming out. Um, you are proof that there is way out of active addiction into the freedom of recovery. Thank you. Sir.